it's not February yet. It feels like Groundhog's Day here because for the second day in a row, we're talking about the Guardians coaching staff, which is almost flat. The Twins are losing another starting pitcher, and uh, we still don't know what a replay coordinator does or how, what, what, what qualities you need to be a replay coordinator, but we'll talk more about that today on Locked on Guardians. You are Locked on Guardians. Your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am up over there is Justin. As far as I know, this is what a replay coordinator does. Let's see how I can do. Let's see. Nope, didn't hit the dartboard. You're doing... What with 57% last year uh, was was a strong from the previous one. It, it's essentially that. So uh, we don't know the replay coordinator, but we know a lot else. Um, one of the names you've been talking about uh, got one of the positions Re- replacing Rigo. We we have. Should we start with Brad Goldberg, or do you want to start somewhere else? We can start with Brad Goldberg first. Thanks for <laughs> making Lockdown Gardens your first listen today and every day because. We did have some predictions here. We did say we did not. I did not consider Rigo Sodor, which we'll talk about. Well, we we kind of thought Kai Correa might be coming back, and we talked about him yesterday. And then, yeah, Brad Goldberg. We talked about a couple times. I mentioned Owen Dew yesterday. Uh, very quickly too, we are still a six subscribers away from two thousand on YouTube. We'd love to get there so we can stop talking about it on the show, as everybody else would probably also like us to do. So tell a friend. Just create eighty five accounts. Subscribe to us. And we won't talk about it again for another year until we get to 3,000. How about that? Uh, yeah, the Guardians finished off their coaching staff except for the replay coordinator, which I guess we know what a replay coordinator does. I just don't know what qualifies you to be one. And Mike Barnett was good at his job, and he also had other duties too, so I guess we'll find out uh, what else that's going to need. But yeah, Brad Goldberg is now the Guardians bullpen coach. Quick rise for Brad Goldberg. He is a Beachwood, Ohio native. Went to Beachwood High School. I believe he started off his career, college career at Coastal Carolina. Something like that. The Chanta Clears. And then he ended up transferring to Ohio State. He actually coached at Ohio State briefly, too, before uh, joining Cleveland's coaching ranks. But he pitched for the White Sox, the Diamondbacks. Although I don't think he ever reached the majors of the Diamondbacks. I talked to him last year at the News Herald. He reached only, I believe, with the White Sox. He did reach it with the White Sox. He he told me last year that he finished one – one game short of being able to pitch in Cleveland. The, the day he got, he was supposed to co. He was supposed to pitch, or he was, he was up, and the White Sox were coming to Cleveland the next for the next series, and he got sent down, and that was the end of his his major league career. So he came like one road trip short of pitching in Cleveland. The closest he ever got to pitching in Cleveland was uh, pitching at Detroit, which all his family saw, which is cool. But he went to Beachwood High School. Uh, he's only thirty three years old. He only two years in the system. He was the he was like a roving pitching instructor uh, in 2021, and then last year he got um, the bullpen or the pitching coach job with Akron. So he moved very quickly, and now he is the um, the bullpen coach. And he's worked with a lot of these guys, obviously, um, in the minors. I know he he was uh, the pitching coach last year for Cantillo and and Gavin Williams and a bunch of these other dudes that were down there. Cade Smith he had this past year, so. Very familiar with a lot of these these pitchers. Um, very interested to see though. They must they, obviously they're pretty high on him because you know coaches just don't re- reach the major leagues after uh, two minor league seasons. Yeah. So I uh, so my brush with with Brad Goldberg is uh, I interviewed him his senior year of college at Ohio State through I think it was the IBI message boards or maybe it, it was through Twitter. I, I got to know his mom who then gave me his phone number and I did an interview posted that I believe on scouting baseball when I was running it my last year in New York. And then I remember I took him in one of my shadow drafts that year as a, uh, a senior sign, which, Hey, he made to the majors. That would have been a a solid pick. But you know, again, the, the speed at which he moves says a lot. Um, The other fast mover was, was Jason Tubbs who, what, seven years in system, but Josh Tubbs, I'm sorry. Um, was a pitcher at Belmont and then in 2018 became a hitting coordinator for Cleveland. And then, you know, they're they're picking these, these guys on the fly uh, who are moving very quickly, except for uh, Rugi Odor, who (laughs) the opposite of moving quickly is the story of Rugi. 
Yeah, Tubbs. Yeah, Tubbs got hired here in, in 2018, so he has been uh, he's been here for seven years now. So also moved fairly quickly. Interesting that he is the hitting analyst. He has an, a degree in exercise science. Uh, yes. I'm I'm very excited for Rugo Sodor to get this job. To be honest with you, if anybody's ever had any interactions with Rugo Sodor, great interview. You you would be excited for him too. This is a really good dude. Um, obviously, he is. I don't know if anybody's familiar. He's the uncle of uh, Rube Denador, former. Rangers and um, he he played the Orioles. I think too. he was a Yankee for a second. He actually had to shave his beard. Remember, mm-hmm. also the dude that knocked out uh, Jose Bautista in Texas. So uh, Guardians, a lot of lineage there with a uh, good right hook. Anyway, Odor's fifty-five. This is going to be his thirty-fourth year in the Cleveland system in twenty twenty-four. So uh, he was a minor league player in nineteen eighty-eight with them, and then and he switched to coaching. Um, he was in 1988, 1998, he became a coach with them. But he is the winningest manager of all time for the AA uh, Akron Rubber Ducks slash, slash Arrows. He was the last Just manager great... I interviewed there. Um, yeah, he's been there was... for a couple of years now. And and just a really good dude. I mean, he, he's a straight shooter, always very honest, um, not afraid to, you know. When, when managers talk to – reporters who are coming minor league games you get a lot of um run packs. around double speak you get a lot of just coded stuff but they don't they're trying to give you any information and i'm not saying odor ever gave anything away he should have given away which is very honest and if he can tell you something he tells you and if he can he just just tells you he's like yeah he just lets it go so uh very honest straight shooter i think he's very well liked i know the players loved him uh akron loved him so he'll be the infield coordinator kai correa is the Kai Correa is the major league field coordinator and Rugo Sodor will be the infield court coach. Um, he will also coach third base for the guardians. So big task there to coach third base. Mike Saba, very aggressive, uh, right arm he uses right arm or his left arm to wave home. I'm trying to think, what do you, what do you use to wave home? Is it left? I think it's left. Yeah. Cause you would, you would do yeah, this too. Yeah. Let's go. Collect some yeah. arms, right. Yep. So yeah, he's got a he's got a lot on his left arm riding there to to be aggressive and um, send those runners home. But excited for for Rugi, uh, a lifer who spent a long time in the minor leagues and finally gets rewarded with a major league job. Craig Albernez ends up as the bench coach, which is Bit interesting too. Well, he is okay. So we talked about this yesterday, right? We said that uh, every manager friend. has has the right hand man, and and we didn't know who else they were going to go with. So you went with somebody close to vote who he trusts, who he's worked with before and, um, you know, has a good relationship with that, that can make a difference. So not, not totally a surprise too, when you think about it, I just didn't know which direction they were going to go with that. But when he said, you know, it's good to have somebody you're familiar with, but also is willing to um, challenge you and, uh, you know, push you and, and not always just agree with you. Um, that's a good thing. Yeah. It, it felt interesting to me just from the perspective of like, they talked about maybe wanting a little bit more experience back there um, or trying to get, you know, or maybe it's just, we thought they would want more experience with a rookie manager. And instead they went for comfort over experience, which is fine. But with them saying like, we want to have coaching settled by last week and they pushed it to this week. Part of me, the, you know, I, I don't have my tin foil on hand, but if I could, I'd put it here. Part of the tin foil makes me wonder if they were trying to get someone else, if they had someone else that they were maybe circling and it fell apart. And that's why this was a little delayed and why they ended up with, um, you know, someone a little more inexperienced back there. Um, and it is a little I bit weird. Who's to say they weren't done? Who's to say they weren't, they weren't finished and they just waited to this week announce, to announce it. It's a little weird to have that. I mean, Kai Correa is the most experienced coach on the staff, right? In terms of like calling well, the games got, being in the moment. And he was well, ahead got, of Albernaz. You got in Carl Willis. And you got Sandy Alomar and you got Victor Rodriguez, who's been around a little bit. So I guess Sandy still Alomar has more experience as a, as a manager than Craya, but it's, it's, it's just some interesting choices. Um, but yeah, you know, I guess we'll I, find out. Yeah. Correa was, Correa was the bench coach in San Francisco and Albernes was like, uh, was the catching coordinator or yeah, whatever that was. He was something day. I again, it just kind of, it's interesting how much they leaned into a San Francisco team that again, as, as I said yesterday, uh, was disappointing. I mean, they had their good moments over there. They, they definitely, what was it? 2021 
they surprisingly made the playoffs with a group of kind of a ragtag yeah, roster. But since so then, it's it's they've been, gone backwards. It, yeah, yeah, for sure. Gone backwards. Yeah, so I guess we'll find out. Like I said yesterday, pro, is it you know process results? What do they think about? I guess we'll find out about Cleveland's process in here. But yeah, he's. I don't think vote did not overlap with Correa, but obviously he knows Albernez, and they feel they feel <laughs> comfortable with Kai Correa. And and look, Kai Correa also was getting offers for other other things too. So it's not like he wasn't in demand. Uh, he was going to find a job somewhere else anyway. And I think Albernez probably was too. All those guys were going to get jobs elsewhere. So. That just says that uh, just because they didn't work on that staff doesn't necessarily mean that things were bad. I mean, they were going to get jobs elsewhere. It wasn't like they're going to be out of baseball because they were so bad. No, I mean, it's not like they're the Los Angeles Angels over there. Yeah, who are just firing people left and right to bring in 50-year-old dudes that haven't been around the game for for 15 years since they retired. So, yeah, the rest of the, rest of the coaching staff is filled out except for the replay coordinator. Maybe they'll just uh, rotate that or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how that ends up. Uh, Maybe it'll be one of us. See. We we got Maybe all this experience with with, uh, with video editing and, and and things on here. Maybe. Oof. Maybe they're just I waiting. That. I don't want to have to live up to that. But uh, we know who won't be in Cleveland next year. It, well, I don't know if the Cardinals come to Cleveland. It won't be Sonny Gray though. He's going to be pitching in a different division next year. The Twins lost another starting pitcher, and it's getting kind of ugly around here. And what does the pitching market look like? We're going to continue to discuss that on Lockdown Guardians. Whatever the pitching market looks like, it certainly will not affect your chances to score early this NFL season. Vandal America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. It's $150 if your team wins. So you can think about joining Fanduel. There's no better time to get in on the action. And hey, if you don't like the money line bet, I definitely don't think the money line bet is going to be the way to go for the rounds next week in LA with Joe Flacco starting. So uh maybe turn your attention elsewhere. Don't maybe maybe bet the under on how many how many uh, uh catches Amari Cooper is going to have. Maybe bet the under on the uh points scored in that game. The app's easy to use. There's a wide range of options. Spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. Before we get to the pitching market, too, that'll be a move discussed on Lockdown MLB with our pal Sully. And you can catch more of that on Lockdown Sports Today, the first ever national 24-7 sports streaming channel on YouTube. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts from all of our Locked On shows and the national shows covering every league. So go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube. After you're done listening to Locked On Guardians, of course, don't click away until we're done, please. Uh, subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Uh, winter meetings are next week. How many, how many stories are we going to have for the Guardians on Locked On Sports Today? Um... <laughs> Coming up at the end of the uh, week, yeah. we do our winter meetings primer. Maybe I mean the uh, we got to discuss at some point that the um, the lotto is happening. Yeah, that's going to happen. That's going to have the winter meetings. Yeah, we'll, that might we'll be the most the important meetings. thing that happens to this team at the winter meetings is the lot the uh, MLB draft uh, lottery for you know draft position. You know, if a year the, ago, if Fanduel gave you odds on that, yes, I would say that is the most likely the most important headline for Cleveland going into the winter meetings. Uh, we'll do We'll do a winter meetings episode uh, later in the week. A lot of, I'm, I'm surprised at how much the pitching market has moved already. And maybe it's just, it's St. Louis. Maybe I shouldn't say pitching market. Maybe I should say St. Louis because St. Louis is now signed. Um, they've signed Sonny Gray today, a three year, $75 million deal. They signed Lance Lynn to come back. They signed Kyle Gibson. So, the Cardinals are just signing all the starting pitching out there, but that's not named Aaron Nola. So I don't know. I, I would say the mar- the market's moving, but it's just the Cardinals for the most part making the market move. But uh, By yeah, signing no more Sunny Gray. Uh, signing every geriatric relative to MLB standards, geriatric pitcher available on the market. How old is Sunny? Sunny Gray is thirty. Yeah, okay. Sunny Gray is thirty four. He is. Yeah. Is he the youngest of the three they just signed? Yes. He is. Kyle Gibson's uh, 36. Lance Lynn is 37. Uh, by the time his contract is done, he will be 37. Uh, they, they, they're, you know, Miles Miklos is 
early 30s to mid 30s. I mean, no, he's mid 30s. Steven Matz is the young dude currently in that rotation at 32. Their youngest starter is 32. That's old, huh? I'm 30. In baseball, I mean, <laughs> in baseball, yes. I think we all can yeah. agree that, you know, once you hit 30, it's like borrowed time for most players. Um, Who's going to pitch for the Twins next year? Like, <laughs> look, I, Cleveland, like I said, we've talked about this yesterday. Cleveland, they've got a solid five. Beyond that five, there's a lot of question marks. There's, there's certainly upside, but there's no experience and a lot of question marks. For the Twins, it's like, a starting three and then after that you're kind of like squinting to see the rest and then you've got a bunch of other guys that are in the minors i don't know what the twins are going to do for pitching but it's not good right now and they want to chop more payroll up they're projected to be what did i say 125 next year as of right now and they definitely want to get that number down they're they're trying like hell to trade christian vasquez i think i'm again this is groundhogs day repeating ourselves uh from yesterday but it's the second day in a row that the Twins lost a key piece of their pitching staff uh, from the last several years. So I yeah, like their and top three, but I, and I like the Guardians' top five, truthfully. But it's, uh, you know, of course, Cleveland's got its own question marks in the top five, but at least they, they have five starters. The Twins, I don't think, have five starters right now. And unless you, you know, really like Louis Varland, which I don't. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do like uh, Winder who's one of their other guys. And, you know, David Festa is interesting, but I'm not sure. I, part of me thinks he might be more a reliever than a starter. Simone would Ridge Richardson is, I mean, you're hoping he's a back end guy. It's kind of backed up for him. Uh, Chris Paddock is not pitched uh, a whole bunch in the last three, four years. Joe That's Ryan's rough. great. You know, yes. uh, Pablo Lopez was fantastic great. for them. Um, you got Bailey Ober in there is, is a more of like a back end guy. Uh, and then, you know, Varland and the like, it's, it's kind of ugly. And, you know, when they were bad in 2022, their top five starters were Chris Archer, uh, Dylan Bundy, Sonny Gray, <laughs> Bundy. but I mean, they still Ooh. had Sonny Gray at that point. And right. now they don't now they don't. And, and Joe Ryan and their, I can't, uh, Devin Smeltzer was their fifth and Smeltzer didn't even throw a hundred innings. And last year they had five guys through a hundred innings. They had a uh, camp, they had a Uber driver on their pitching staff. It was uh, yeah. Randy Dobnik. <laughs> and they, you know, they sat there and, um, you know, it, 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 Maeda had their fifth most innings. Gray had their second most innings. And they're losing a lot of innings. And they don't have a guaranteed replacement. And that's huge for a team that in 2022 and 2023, we saw the difference when they had Dab, pitchers yeah. they could count on. And they had guys they knew that they could count on. And now they're going back to 2022 where they don't. And this is, why is this so much like 2022? Because in the Sonny Gray role is Pablo Lopez, right? Like that's the guy in that role for them. Joe Ryan is in the Joe Ryan role. Um, and it, there isn't really a Kenta Maeda hating and out for them to come Bailey around Ober? there. I, I like, I mean, listen, Bailey I've been Ober. driving the Bailey Ober wagon since his college or Charleston days, but I him being a, Maeda him having a fifth him being a fifth starter was about the best possible outcome. Um, right yeah. Now, it, it, to be their third. Yeah. It, it's, it's rough for them. And where are they going to get pitching in this market? That's a good question for everybody. Who's going to get pitching in the market. Um, and the twins are going to get a comp pick between the first round and the comp a round. <laughs> I think um, it ha almost so has to be the 33rd overall selection. The only way that will change is if, Baltimore or Arizona sign a free agent because they would lose their second highest pick and they're the teams that have the bonus picks from the rookie of the year awards. So unless yeah. one of them sign a free agent and they lose that draft pick, um, I think it's almost destined to be the 33rd overall pick because none of the other um, qualifying offer players came from teams that would also qualify for a first round selection. And that will bump Cleveland's pick down in the comp a round. Once yeah. that's decided Cardinals will lose their second highest pick of the draft which will be their uh, second their rounder pick? their second round. They don't have a comp yeah, they don't have comp picks anymore. They did at one point in time, I want to say, but um, yeah. I believe that is their second rounder and they are going to, uh, it moves up Cleveland's second rounder, I believe, because they had a worse record. Um, yep. But it, it well, but no, it doesn't. The Cardinals because, had a worse record. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Cause it'll move, yeah you're right. Cleveland will it, move up it'll now. balance it out. So it's like, you know, the, the added pick, it won't affect Cleveland's second round pick. Um, but if it had been a team after Cleveland who had signed him, then all of a sudden 
the comp pick would have moved Cleveland's pick down without giving them right. any moving up. So in it this will, case, it is the best situation for Cleveland's relative draft position. It will probably slightly affect money because if their comp pick moves down, that's a little bit less money. Yes. The second round pick moving up. Well, the, the not, second round pick's going to stay exactly the same because the comp, the second round pick that goes away and the comp uh, pick moving yeah, in will balance out. So if it was a team that had picked after them, it, the second round pick would be later and that wouldn't balance out at all. So it'd be two picks moving backwards. Um, but yeah, it will be less money. Yeah. Slightly moving down a pick. Well, uh, let's see. The twins may not have any money to sign anybody. Who knows? Well, the guardians, I don't know either. We want to talk about whether or not the Cardinals are going to keep adding pitching, uh, how the twins will try to cut some payroll. If they can make a deal with Cleveland, maybe this is a hypothetical. I thought was interesting that we talked about and, uh, more on the pitching market on lockdown guardians. All right, you want to talk about the Cardinals pitching still, or do you want to talk about the trade that won't happen that I threw out first? Um, I think so we've done enough with the Cardinals. Well, right. let's talk about this. There's still people who think the Cardinals aren't done. <laughs> does does them signing Sonny Gray and Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson take them out of a Shane Bieber trade if – if the Cleveland even considers this, because we both, I mean, it's going to be hard to trade him at this point. But does this likely say that the Cardinals, if there is a Shane Bieber trade or a market for this, um, does this take the Cardinals out of the running? Because this was one of the teams that might have been an interested party. I had to laugh at the, uh, you know, I, I was pulling up Stephen Matz's numbers and the, um, the writer for a St. Louis blog who's like, Stephen Matz makes. Uh, trading Stephen Matz for Tyler Glass now makes too much sense for the Cardinals. I'm like, I, I assume there will be secondary pieces, but I'm like, mm, I, I, you know, too too much sense might be a, a bit of a broad statement. On this. <laughs> Stephen Matz um, threw 105 innings last year, the year before that 48, the year before that 150. He is a pitcher who his best war ever was a 2.2. Uh, I'm sorry, he had a 2.5 as a rookie, but he's at two years over two, which is, you know, your league average player. So he has barely been league average. He has struggled to stay on the mound. Um, he's a nice kind of depth guy, but he is definitely not. Listen, he's fine as a five. But right now the problem for St. Louis is Lance Lynn is probably a six. Kyle Gibson is a five. Um, you also have, you know, they're full of fives. Um, it's like me in a lineup at a bar, just a bunch of fives. Um I'm being <laughs> generous there, but uh, here's the thing. It's, it's just not, it's a weird team building. Um, I, and I think the other thing that could be interesting is a St. Louis still has outfielders for days. Like, you know, Victor Scott's really interesting. Uh, there's the Alec Burleson of it all. There's the, you know, all the, you know, Dylan Carlson and all those players we've talked about a million times with the Cardinals. Again, I don't think they're going to move Lars Newbar. I know that question is coming. I just, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but there is a world where something like Shane Bieber with maybe relief help, like they still need to add relievers too. That's, that is the one thing where Cleveland could, even if it's not Bieber, they could maybe still make a smaller deal. Um, because yes, they went out and added Barlow to help the, back end but they still have a lot of relief options like still a team with um many potential relievers more than they might have spots for um you know i'll trade them 99 for jordan walker what what, what say you yeah these sure. Cardinals fans I, do not comment that is a joke i'm pretty sure that we would get arrested for suggesting kidnapping and blackmailing their GM into forcing them to make that trade. Sure. I'm sure that would go very well. I mean, so, that's what, that's what Alex Anthopoulos does every year at the winter meetings, right? <laughs> this is true. Maybe that's a tactic Cleveland. Had, that's how they're going to get Dylan C's. I think that the, I still think the Cleveland's not going to trade Shane Beaver unless they're bl yeah. blown away for a deal. But even if, even if they were going to get blown away for a deal, I don't think it's going to be the Cardinals. I think that they have kind of, cause look, they still owe Steven Matz, uh, 11 million over the next two seasons. So they're stuck with him unless they can move him, which, you know, maybe they can move him. Yeah. Obviously they're going to train for Taylor glass. Now it makes too much sense. Um, they're stuck with him. So I, I have a feeling that, that they're not going to be in uh, on Shea Beaver. Here's the other one I came up on the fly. Cause the twins are trying to, and this is not going to happen. So this is just a, this is just a hypothetical because <clears throat> everyone's favorite punching bag. Miles straw is involved here. So 
the Twins are trying desperately, as I said, to move anybody on their team that they owe money to besides Lopez, Correa, and uh, Byron Buxton, because I don't think anyone's even taken Byron Buxton at this point. Anyway, Christian Vasquez, they owe him $10 million over the next two seasons. Um, he got benched last year because he wasn't hitting, and his defense was, was actually decent. Um, but right now, the projected center fielder is Willie Castro, former Cleveland prospect, who had a very nice year last year, but it's probably best suited for a – um, a utility role where he can move around every day and, um, you know, so they want to commit all, all your center field at best. And maybe the twins will go out and add somebody else in center field. But would you rather have Miles Straw, who let's see how much he's owed the next couple of years. And it, it's a Miles Straw is owed a lot more money than, than Christian Vasquez, uh, Christian Vasquez. So let's say that Straw is owed um, about 5 million a year. It's average value over the next uh, three seasons. And then there's a buyout in 2027 that they're going to owe him uh, to get out of that contract in yeah, 2027, 1.75. But um, it's f- almost five this year. It's six and a half next, and it's 7.5 in 2026. Would you rather have Vasquez or Straw? Because Well, then it's the same contract because – the numbers you just said at five, six and a half, and seven and a half, and one point seven five would be basically twenty one million versus twenty million for Vasquez. Right, so it kind of evens out. It's just that Vasquez is in that case. I am one hundred percent sticking with Straw because I'd rather have the speed and defense as a twenty six man rather than a ten million dollar backup catcher. And I think yeah, Bettencourt it- can do what he can do. Um, you know, I would be curious too with the Twins. Before we say they have no center fielder, I mean Max Kepler is a pretty good defensive right fielder. Like there is a world they where they trade could. Him too. They've been wanting to trade him for two years. I well, I don't think. I, I mean, I understand wanting to trade him. He's got a decent contract, um, and he's a year from free agency. But at the same time, they got to place some guys if they want to compete. It's you know they uh, Willie Castro is kind of you know their utility guy. Play everywhere someone they, they got to keep a few of these guys and you know it, it's it, polanco it's kepler are free agents to be um we saw well, them it's a, it's a bad contract for a bad con- i'm sorry Justin. it's, it's yeah. a bad contract for a bad contract yeah for I cleveland think... they already have beth and court like you said so that's that it that causes one roadblock and technically you're getting out of the deal sooner i know if you're if you're committed to a big con a bad contract, you want it spread out over a long time, or would you rather pay the money up front and get out of it sooner? Which they kind of did in the the Chris Johnson deal. They they paid a little more up front and then got out of it sooner than they would have with Bourne and Swisher. But it was trade. it was spread out, right? Like the same thing with like the Segura deal. Like technically, Segura had more years than Bell. Johnson technically had more years than Swisher. No, they're and only Johnson. they're only they're only paying Segura. This year coming up, and then next year they owe him two million dollar buyout. Buyout, so it's only, yeah, yeah. It's but, only it's only two. It's only technically it's only two years, but the buyout's only two million for twenty twenty five, and this year it's eight point five. So it's a wash on the Bell deal, really. So I, I mean, I would personally, if they didn't have Beth and Court, I would say I would rather have Vasquez at ten million dollars for the next two years as the backup than Straw. Um, I can see that given the Guardian situation, but they already have Beth and Court, so. It's probably not going to happen, but it's you know it's hypothetical. If you if Cleveland really wanted to trade Miles Straw, they're going to have to take on a bad contract. And I think that feels like an interesting option. It feels like that's the deal they would not want to do more Cleveland than um, than the Twins because uh, if Straw like rebounds at all and then is like a Gold Glove center fielder and is that like eighty runs created plus guy that they hope for, then all of a sudden that looks really bad for them. So. That's all, that's all awesome, especially in division. Be, yeah, and all Vasquez is going to be as your backup anyway. Backup, so yeah. And so he, not that I expect defender. him to do that. <laughs> I do. I do not. But no. But that's your your worst worst nightmare if that happens. Yeah. Yeah. For what it's worth, Vasquez last year defensively, um, seventy fifth percentile blocking, sixty first percentile caught stealing, seventy percentile framing, fifty ninth percentile in pop time. So defensively overall, not a bad player. Offensively, he was pitiful, and uh, the strikeout rate went up. The swing strike rate went got, got worse. He's thirty-two, so he's definitely 
his best days are, are long behind him. And that was a bad deal by the twins, which is why they are now in payroll hell with the, well, yeah. I don't know. I'm sure that I'm I, sure their owners have money and the TV contracts yeah. drying up. So what, they just... the pull ins who are worth billions. Um, right. The Cry. Kodiak Cry. Heirs or owned it uh, uh, to me. Still the most mind boggling thing with the twins is Kyle farmer for 6.6 6 million. Like Mike, like Oof. why he didn't even have 400 plate appearances. I get he was a like, this is a classic wave him and try and bring him back at a lower thing. Like why? Like someone was asleep at the wheel. It feels like literally someone forgot to file paperwork. Well, that would be Derek Fowley, former Guardians front office member, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Well, we are not asleep at the wheel because we've got shows out the wazoo all week. Um, so what's coming up next on this week? We've got positional reviews we got to do. We got second base, shortstop, third base, outfield, starting pitching, relief pitching we still have to do. Uh, not all this week, of course. We have to do our winter meetings primer because the winter meetings start on Monday. We'll include the... Um, Draft lottery, of course, as part of that. We'll talk about the Rule 5 as that is a week away as well uh, from this Wednesday. The highlight of the winter meetings, obviously. So we'll talk about that. And then don't forget, Friday is the mailbag. So any questions you have for us for Friday's show, get it in on YouTube, Twitter, wherever you can uh, shout out at us. Don't don't shout at us physically, please. We don't like that. We don't want to be yelled no. at. But uh, give us your questions if you got winter meeting stuff. And then uh, at some point we'll tackle that. Let's make a deal. Um episode we'll have to make 29 episodes for the offseason so we've got a lot to do coming up on lockdown yeah. guardians we got, and a that, five draft and a dra- we got a rule five draft and a draft lottery and all that fun so you'll be wanting to tune in here for every move and action cleveland makes uh so make sure you are subscribed rate and review download it helps and uh tell a friend they have to subscribe uh just tell them they have to that's all you want for christmas uh thank you and go go guardians go